This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Jumbo Jumbo everyone, warm welcome to you here in the Maasai Mara of Kenya. We have a very beautiful sunrise today. Welcome aboard to your very own safari live from the African wilderness. Good morning everyone and welcome to the Maasai Mara of Kenya. We have a very beautiful sunrise. It's super magical. My name is Tim and behind camera we have Big James this morning. It's 25 degrees Celsius. A very nice weather today. You can hear the birds chirping. An indication that it's going to be a very nice morning. Look at that. Please send us your questions and comments, hashtag Wild Earth, on the YouTube comment section at AFC. For young viewers, kids question at wildearth.tv. And then on, please head over to wildearth.tv slash explorers and see such some of our exciting, exciting news that we talk about on that particular segment. So it's going to be a very nice morning I expect so looking forward for the crossing the zebra crossing it was unfortunate that we could not show the end of it as it got to a close of the time but we hope that today is going to be a nice morning as well fingers crossed all those zebras managed to cross despite having 12 crocodiles none of them was caught and killed but one got into the jaws of the crocodile but wrestled off he was a super strong stallion wrestled off four crocodiles and managed to walk out of the river the giraffe also made it across the opposite direction it was a nice morning indeed so just a moment of silence as we just watch this beautiful sunrise and the sound of the african bush
Lauren, indeed it looks like a painting. Thank you for your comment. Mario Zotes, what a beautiful sun and sunrise and magical it is to just wake up into this. It's super beautiful. Jumbo, Jumbo, everyone, welcome to another side of the Mara. And same as Tim is admiring, I have the little Thompson's Gazelle. And look at that. It's just one of those mornings. It's just wow. Thompson's Gazelle. Very common in these East African plains and one dominant antelope in the Mara Serengeti ecosystem. It's an antelope that migrates and annually we get about 200,000 of them migrating from the Serengeti to the Masai Mara. I am Isaac and on camera we have Bungay. There was a word that there is a big male lion that was seen down this direction and that's where I'm heading. Nobody knows who he was and so I'm trying to find him. Apart from him, I'll try and find the river pride and maybe you know the little cubbies that have eluded us for quite a long time but that is the kind of start that i have for you this morning what do you think they're just the two of them but they make such a nice picture this is a small antelope and it's super fast and it turns at very sharp angles favorest to the cheetah and looks like they're a bit skittish i don't know why maybe it's good for me to drive up there and investigate a little bit more they've been looking in that one direction for quite a bit we had a lot of rain last night they say you know cat and dogs but we don't have dogs here so we are it rains lions and hyenas last night it is so wet it's hard to believe look at this i've come to this opening and it's just beautiful time to take a look on what is around what do you see bungay anything we have trees grass yeah, and a nice, nice, nice open view. Look at that. There's some, some people, I think, they are doing safari a la balloon over there. Yeah, that is one luxury that you can do here. Best time to do it is when the migration is here because all the wildlife below you is just unbelievable. That is a sea of grass. And that's where our cats could be, unless they pop up their head. I might drive past them, but, you know, 
we might see one, you never know. Way down there is the beautiful Mara River forest. It's one of the four habitats that we get in the Masai Mara. We have this open savanna, wooded savanna, the Mara River forest, and then the Ololulu escarpment. There's a bit of mist way down there. Yeah, that's where all our animals are. Does look very, very empty, but I promise you, definitely there is something. There's always something hiding in that long grass. Do we have a bird? Yes. Looks like a northern ant eating chat. And oh, looks like he lost his tail. What happened to your tail? Oh, actually, it's a juvenile. Yes, it's a northern ant eating chat. They love termite mounds and they feed on termites a lot, plus other insects. It's one of those birds that is unmistakable. You always find it here in these beautiful plains. I think the best thing for me to do is to move and try and find something. Well, while I do that, let's take you to another live location. sitting in the Timbavati riverbed just appreciating the dawn chorus of all of the birds and it's an absolutely stunning place to be welcome to Anbian Ngala everybody my name is Tessa I'm going to be your guide on safari this morning behind the camera we have Sebastian and this morning I'm actually looking for leopards so I thought I'd come down to the riverbed this morning and just have a look if we can see any tracks and so we've been looking through the riverbed here, just trying to have a look if there's any, maybe alarm calling, any fresh tracks of a leopard. And we just noticed that the bird calls this morning are absolutely stunning. Have a listen. So it's a really beautiful morning here. It's overcast, so it's nice and cool. Thank you so much, everybody. It's so good to be back. <laughs> it's stunning weather here today. You can see it's nice and overcast, nice and cool. So I'm hoping that that means the leopards will be a bit more active today. So we've been looking through all of these big trees, looking for maybe an impala carcass or even a leopard lying in the tree. But it's still nice and early, so I'm actually hoping we get one on the move. And in fact, from camp this morning, I heard a lion calling north of the river too. So it's always a good idea to check down here, especially in the mornings when it's fresh and cool, because if anything's crossed the river, it's nice and easy to see the tracks. It's a beautiful open area. And this is also maybe where things like impalas and kudus and yalas will be in the mornings waking up. So it's a good place for a leopard or a lion to come and find some food. But I love this particular stretch of the riverbed. It's an area called Rue Castles Crossing here at Anbiondongala. And I've always loved sitting here and appreciating the scenery. To me, it's one of the most beautiful crossings. It's quite unique with that island in the middle. This is often where you might find something like a leopard or a lion actually denning. And that big tree that you can see coming into the frame on the right, that is called an anna tree. And it's one of the very few that you'll find in this area. And you see it doesn't have any leaves. And that's because it's the total opposite of any other tree you'll find here. It actually has leaves in winter and is bare in summer. So it's just lost majority of the leaves. And this one is estimated between 400 and 600 years old. So I always just feel sitting here is an absolute honor to think about what was here 400 years ago. It's also a perfect tree for a leopard. <laughs> Absolutely stunning, stunning area. Listen to the birds. Mm -hmm. 
Safari Kitty, this riverbed hasn't flowed consistently since around 2012. It would take a lot of consistent rain in quite a heavy downpour, maybe, you know, getting 100 to 200 millimeters in maybe a day or two or three consistently for this river to flow. We have had it every now and then for a day or two in the last three years that I've been here that it has come down quite hard and so in certain sections of a few hundred meters of the river we've seen some water flowing. But with the way that it's been going with the droughts and a bit of climate change we haven't seen this river flow consistently in a long time. Um, so I don't think there'll be water anytime soon. But it's amazing to think, Safari Kitty, that this river used to flow from bank to bank at one point. I can't even imagine it. It must have been... The sound alone would have been incredible. Just to hear that river flowing, having hippos and crocodiles through here. Must have been absolutely mind-blowing. It almost looks like a beach now. But I actually love being down here in the riverbed, even though it is dry. So I'm gonna move on down the riverbed. I'm looking for tracks in the sand there. You can see a few coming down of elephants and buffaloes. I'm gonna keep going and hopefully I find something like a leopard track. A very good morning to you from and beyond Puna Private Game Reserve. We just came into this western sector of the reserve and you can see these beautiful rolling hills that we've got here. And uh, my name is uh, Diewald and behind the camera we've got uh, Craig. And we've come into this area to see if we can maybe look for some black rhino this, um, this morning. We are on a nice vantage point here and we can already see some rhinos in the distance. Um, we can see at least two herds of buffalo as well and quite a few elephant bulls spread out all around So we've got quite a few animals to work with this morning. See if we can get a view of them um, But like I said the main purpose for this morning I think Craig and I set us ourselves a bit of a goal see if we can maybe find some some black rhino So these open rolling hills that's here um, it does look like it's a bit of um, open grassland or so, but I'm sure you can see little bushes and everything that's growing around here. And most of them are um, sickle bush and some guaris. So the sickle bush is what these rhinos would be feeding on, these black rhinos. So they will head into the sections that uh, Craig's filming now, and then we'll see if we can we can track down some some rhinos we can already spot a few rhinos from the uh, from the distance but most of them look like they are white rhinos just by looking at the, the shape of their heads and the shape of their bodies or so now uh, as you can see there is quite a few um, clumps of trees and so in the valleys between these hillsides so Tess was just telling you about the um, dry riverbeds at Tungala, so these are also dry riverbeds, but they're more um, more towards like drainage lines than anything else. They don't really flow as much. It really needs to rain quite a lot. I suppose the ones at Ngala also needs a lot of water to come down them, but these ones are more where all the water runs down from these catchment areas, these hillsides, and then into some watering holes. And we'll obviously need to drive along these uh, drainage lines as well as it's nice and dense there so maybe through the night there was or actually through the night there was a little bit of rain and maybe a bit of wind or so and it's a good place for maybe a rhino to go hide away try and get out of the wind and, and the rain but it's nice and cool for now and we've got a bit of mist clouds over but I think it's going to be a nice and hot day so hopefully these dense areas will also be nice and productive. There's also a pride of lions that hang around in this area. This is like the center of their territory. So we'll see if we can maybe track some of them down. Oh, there's a herd of buffalo that's now slowly getting up, not too far away from us. They are 
they were actually all lying down, so we couldn't see all of them that well, but we can see the herd that's just starting to to wake up now, and they're starting to stretch their legs and move down the hill towards the water that's on the right inside there. So this open grassland doesn't have a lot of standing water, so all the animals are moving down to the water, I think, for a nice early drink. But like I said, Craig and I still have a lot of um, areas to cover to look for those um, black rhinos, but we'll come back to you with what we find a little bit later on on our way. The vault is waiting for buffaloes to arrive. We've already got some. Calm after the storm last night. These buffaloes are away to have a bit of a... That one there is just eating underwater. It was very odd. Come here to enjoy the water on this nice, calm morning. Are you expecting more stormy weather tomorrow? For now, all is well. The buffaloes are enjoying the quiet. Oh, that one there is very excited. Look at that. I decided to have made it through the night. I'll tell you what, with that thunder and lightning that was happening, I'm also quite glad we made it through the night. Hi, I'm Mike, uh, and behind the camera is BK, and you've joined us at Eco Training's Pridelands Conservancy, where we are waiting to see if there are any telltale signs of predators or other animals coming down to the water. Um, after that stormy night last night, quite certain that there must have been a lot of predatory activity. I know certainly the hyenas were visiting, visiting us in camp, which is always... Quite exciting. These buffaloes have given us no indication that they've seen anything untoward. There's a buffalo there just having a bit of breakfast. Oh, she probably didn't eat anything. Probably just regurgitated a little bit of food. Much easier. No need to walk anywhere. No need to go to the fridge. Carry your food with you. Very peaceful. Lots of Rattling cesticulars calling. The Egyptian geese are walking along the edge. The blacksmith lapwings being very calm. It's a peaceful scene. So there were actually a lot more buffaloes earlier on. Oh, that one's having a bit of a stra scratch. Scratching his neck and chin on that uh, horizontal piece of log there. It's a very big buffalo, isn't it? Look how muscular that buffalo is. That is something that will be quite formidable for any predator that might be around here. The rest of the buffalo have already moved over to the other side of the of this earth mound over here. They probably were drinking when it was still a little bit darker. They've all finished now and they're going to probably move off. What's really nice is that although it didn't rain heavily last night, there was a nice soft drizzle. So all the grasses are very moist at the moment. As soon as the sun comes up, they absorb all of that moisture and they get very green and bright. As you can see now, it looks very, very bright and green all around us. That means that they can satisfy most of their water requirements just by feeding on the vegetation that they need. It means having to travel a lot less today. Some of them are still lying down. Not quite ready to move just yet, but they won't be left behind. The buffaloes, their, their strength is in their numbers and in the teamwork they have. They're very, one of the very few herbivores that actually will stand by each other and defend each other from predators quite aggressively. A wildebeest might do it a little bit, but they generally will run away eventually. Buffaloes quite often manage to turn the tide, and so they won't leave any members of their, of their group behind. They will eventually all move off together. Massive, powerful bodies. And these are all young, small, a couple of youngsters at the back here, who probably don't want to be right at the back of the herd, they probably want to make their way into the middle, where they can be surrounded by the larger, more powerful buffalo. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to a very overcast day in Juma, but a good one. We are here at the Hyena Den. We've actually been here for a long time, but 
due to the presence of another vehicle and the cubs being determined to go under our car, we haven't been able to get you a visual. They are obsessed with the car. It must smell just wonderful. There we go. I think they're about to go into the car once again. But my name is Lauren. I do have Gert on camera. And we're going to try and stay here as long as possible. There is an adult. We can't show you right now. I don't know who it is. I have a funny feeling it's Corky on the other side. But because of the presence of another vehicle, we can't show you. But I can assure you there definitely is an adult. Oh, they're out. They're out. We do have our rain roof on today, just in case of rain, so it doesn't make it too easy to view the cubbies. Mina Mu, did I give the name of the hyena clan? I'll get Mel to repeat that one more time. I'm not sure I understand the question. I'm still not sure I understand that question, Minamu. It's it's Juma Hyena Clan. So it's not um the clan is just the Juma Hyena clan. I'm not entirely sure. If you're meaning individuals, um that is a decision made by lots of stakeholders. Now unfortunately everyone, I don't know what the cubs have found here, but they are playing with something. been very naughty they found something on the ground but yes mean Mu. if you mean the individuals then it's a group group effort we let the viewers decide the last time we chose shangan names but these this pair here is hearts cubs and they do need names soon But the clan is just the Juma Hyena clan. I don't think anybody actually chose that name. I think it's just quite simply because they are the clan of Juma. But we will reposition. We will try to get you to see the adult. And I think it could be Corky suckling her little daughter. It's so wonderful to see the clan active. I haven't seen Ngwazi or Shambulu. But Corky's daughter and Hart's boy and Hart's girl definitely needs a name. So I imagine it will be a collective effort most likely local names that have meaning and normally it's suggestions put forward by the Juma guides such as Rexon, Aubrey, Mike and then we'll choose ones that fit the cubs. Okay we're going to try and sit here as long as we can and as soon as we can reposition we will. Welcome back to the Mara, everyone. We have a black-headed heron patiently waiting for something just to pop out of the grass. Even though sometimes we see the, these herons in the waters, in the marshes, waiting for fish, tadpoles, and some of the water vertebrates, we always see them out in the open grassland hunting for rodents. They're very patient hunters. Look at how he's watching over and stamping his feet. So whatever is in the grass will be scared whenever this bird is stamping his feet.
and then he spears off with his very long bill. They go off for snakes in these long grasses. I've seen them going for lots of snakes. I've seen them going for rats and grass, grass mice. And it's incredible seeing this bird swallowing a, a mouse. Very patient. See the movement there on the neck shows that he's moving his feet. We have Impala over here and it's quite a big harem. There was a little bit of a scare and they scattered a little bit, but looks like they're coming together. There was a hyena that walked by and now it's gone. It's, it's no, no threat anymore. So they're huddling back together. This is a harem we call it and it's a lot of females and just one solitary male he's far left over there busy looks like it's a little bit of browsing eating a, a little shrub they're well adapted in parlors they'll eat shrub and very many medicinal plants as well as plenty of grass. He's in charge of all these females and it's not an easy task because there is some males somewhere who would like to have them also. And so there is always conflict to dominate these many females. We sometimes come across what we call a bachelor herd which is just only males. And from that herd, normally there is one who feels ready to challenge this male and he would appear. And this guy will try and defend his females. It is such a hard task because sometimes later they start scattering and he had to bring, he has to bring them together, gather them together also chase away lone males that are not ready but they're trying to take over at the same time very little time to feed and at the same time also he's watching out for predators so he gets very little time of himself his conditions does deteriorate quite fast and just imagine if there is about five females coming into season every day it adds an extra job for him so he does go down quite quickly but the first few days he meets quite a lot with as many females as possible to guarantee that his gene continues and usually the females sometimes are very cheeky they'll want him as much as he uh, as much as he's strong when he starts to weaken sometimes you see them starting to spread away and when they see males, sometimes they will run towards those males because the urge to meet with a newer, healthier male is very much in their blood. And so it is very tough for a guy. Sometimes he will stand his ground for those males and the fights sometimes are fatal. They fight to death. I have seen one. I didn't see the fight, but I found it on the road. They had a punch of wood straight to the heart. So they do fight to death to try and sire future you know, genes. At this time here, looks like everybody is enjoying the morning sun. And it's all well until female starts moving around. This is an animal that has got very many predators, young ones. 
are taken by jackals, hyenas, wild dogs, even honey badgers will take them. Fully grown ones, leopards are the main culprits, and cheetah, but they are on the menu of all the cats. All the cats take them. I don't know what word has gone around, but you can see there's a little bit of alertness on that corner there. There's a few females that have raised their heads. What is the largest impala I've ever seen? Well, I don't know if you mean size or horn-wise, but maybe let's put it together. Horns, I have seen one. It's actually a pity that you know, I never had a camera those days. I think the horns, horns would have made a record. They were so big, I would notice him and everybody around the area I was in, it was in the southern side of of the Mara, close to Sun River, and he was so big, every guy would notice him. He was so big with big horns. Size-wise, I think generally we have much bigger impala here than anywhere else in Africa, I would say. They are so big here, they can weigh up to around 60, 60, 70 kilo, you know, kilograms. So they're quite big, the impala males or rams, if you want to put it. These guys have equipped with, you know, those beautiful eyes that can see quite far and can detect the slightest movement in the grass. Oh, do you see a hippo way up there? There is a hippo. I can see it on the screen. Maybe we'll get to see him closer later on and their hearing is also very good this you know smelling is also very good this is an animal that has got a gestation period of about six months and there is a rumor that it's able to hold its young for a little bit longer i doubt it i don't think um i don't know i don't think it can it's six months only and they give birth year round we're starting to see quite a good number this time and then next year just before the rains we'll see them and then towards the end of the year we'll also see some young lambs it's actually <clears throat> a super fast antelope and can leap up to around 36 feet which is 12 meters in case of threat and also quite high about nine feet so it can get away you know from many many predators with ease and it's got some interesting um, <clears throat> um what we call fetlock glands in between the horns and also on the back legs these are glands that help leave scents on the ground if they're spooked they will leave a scent. So later on, they can either locate one another or actually trace one another, I think. That's the best way to put it. Look at how many they are. And over here, the male doesn't seem to be stressed in any way. He's just relaxed. We have sounds of frogs also. If you'd like to have five seconds to listen to them. Yes, also we have the ringneck dove da -da 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 at the back there. And also I think I have whistling ducks somewhere else. So everybody is waking up. And the impalas are quite relaxed. We have so many of these impalas, sometimes we tend to forget their beauty. We have herds that can go get up to around 60, 
some of them up to 80. You can tell that the male is starting to get, you know, interested in females, checking who's ready for mating this morning. That's what he does. He goes around. Sometimes he'll pick up their urine that they've urinated, and then that's how he will grimace, flemen testing using his Jacobson's organ, which is an organ situated on the upper side of of the head or the frontal side of the face. It will send a message or a signal to the brain to tell it if a female is coming into season. They can be very entertaining, you know, in parlor sometimes. When they feel like you will see them run around and do what we call pronking or stotting. It's a, a show a show of power, a show of strength where they leap. Sometimes you think they'll you know flip over but it's just showing off. Maybe if I get closer as they are coming towards and maybe Yes, let's take you to another live location so you can enjoy something else. So we saw these two white runners sleeping in a little section. Oh, they're the one just uh, went and lie down there on the right hand side. So just this one standing up here. <laughs> and they were sleeping in this open patch here. And Craig and I saw the tiniest of rhino calves right next to them. And we both started freaking out so much because we thought it was the smallest rhino calf we've ever seen. And then we looked through the binoculars and it was actually... <laughs> it was actually a warthog that was standing next to them. <laughs> uh, we agreed we wouldn't talk about this, but now everyone knows. Um... <laughs> But uh, yeah, so we came down and um, these two white runners just got up briefly. They actually went just a little bit to the right and now they're lying down again. They're very close to some mud wallows here. Um, so I think they, and they're in this little indentation um, in this little uh, clearing. And I think it was nice and out of the weather and out of the wind throughout the night. So if you have a look at this one that's standing up, if you can look on its back there, it's got like quite a big bump on its back, um, close to its rump there, uh, halfway down its back, or oh, before it disappears there. And that's what we look out for, like in the distance, long distance view of these rhinos to see that they are white rhinos. The black rhinos would have more like a saddle in their back, and also their heads would be a little bit higher up on their bodies and not hang as low. Oh, there's the other one just got up. You can see him on the other side there. Let's see if we can creep a little bit forward. Let's see if we can uh, keep on going on the road here in front of us. Oh, there we can just see their heads coming out behind the bush. There, they're going to be in a nice open view for us. Yeah, just turn the vehicle like this so Craig can film past the bars of the vehicle. There we go. Yeah, this is a very good view of them. I'm oh, just taking a wee there. And it looks like the one that's having a wee is a young bull. Or a, not a young bull, but not a dominant bull. And then the one that's next to him there. I wonder if that's also... Oh, okay, that looks like a cow, okay. So, looking at them, they, they size-wise, they're about the same size. So, I think they are both almost fully grown, but not old, old. So, they're probably sticking with each other for some companionship. And look at that, straight away, just going straight into a bit of grazing there with the short, lush green grass growing in that little section. Look at their heads actually moving from left to right and sideways, just feeding on everything as much as they can. Yeah, 
And another thing to look out for, if you see them in a nice short grassed area like this, and you see the hedge right up against the grass like this, you know it's also white rhinos because they'll only be feeding on grass. And the black rhinos that we're going to be looking for this morning, they'll be having their heads maybe in like small bushes or, or something like that, feeding on the twigs and leaves. So if you have a look at the one on the left hand side there, you'll maybe see, the, if he just turns a little bit there you can see it, there's like a little flap of skin that's hanging between his back legs there, so that tells us it's a male. If you look at the one on the right hand side, she doesn't have that flap of skin, but you can sometimes see the female's um, teeth also hanging down between her legs, and that tells us that it's a female. So this young bull on the left hand side, just the fact that he's so close to this female, and also looking at him, see earlier the muscle behind his neck and just the size of his body is not as big as they can get so probably not the dominant bull of this area just yet I don't think they're going to be moving too far away from this spot because there is some mud wallows just off to the side um, probably stick around this area and zigzag around while they're feeding but I think we might leave these two rhinos for now and then see if we can keep on going and look for some other animals. Not the best views, I'm afraid, but it's all we can work with right now. We do have a ribbon snoozing. It's a wonderful, overcast, cool morning. Again, goes back to the theory, when it gets too hot, these cubbies become far too nocturnal. We've got Nguazi, Shimbuli, and Hearts 2 cubs. That's all I can see for now. And as soon as we can reposition, we will. But it's so wonderful to see the den so active. And Ribbon's pair were both suckling, even although they're getting bigger. They will drink mom's milk up to 18 months. It's been a long, I think this is my first time I've came and got the day active. It's nice to see Ribbon here too. She's obviously been a busy lady with all the predators around. Romeo, when they become sexually mature, normally it happens for males first, so it's around two years old, they become sexually mature. <laughs> and it's around about that time that they can decide to sort of disperse or stay with their natal clan. They have a choice. Now, we have a cub coming to our tire. Please don't eat my tires. Now, obviously, if they disperse, then they will leave the clan that they were born in. And they will start at the very bottom of the ladder, and they will go and join a new clan. Whereas if they stay with their natal clan, of course, they may still be high-ranked, but the genetic pool of females to mate with is dramatically reduced. Now, for females, they become sexually mature at three years old. That's normally when you classify any sort of organism as an adult when they're sexually mature. So for males, two. Females, three. Give or take. That's a sort of average ages. This looks like a huge cuddle puddle of hyenas here. Lots of kisses for Miss Ribbon. Jacqueline at this stage, yes. With the hierarchy the way it is, Corky's daughter will be the lowest ranked female. 
You normally take the rank of your mother or slightly below it. So yes, at this stage, unless the hierarchy changes, Corky's daughter will be right at the bottom. <laughs> Whatever's happening there looks very sweet. But the hierarchy obviously can change. Adults can pass away. So we never know within a hyena clan. Lots of kissing going on for Ribbon. That's Heart's Cub, one of Heart's Cubs, giving Ribbon lots of kisses. On cooler mornings like this, you can almost guarantee that the den will be active. I'm just very grateful that there's an adult here. So unfortunately, we don't get to spend a lot of time with the clan like we used to. I really, really wanted to spend some time with Ntima to see if there's any signs of lactating, any suckle marks. There was suspicions for a while that she may, in fact, have her own litter. But unfortunately, until we spend time with her, we're not going to know that. I haven't seen many males hanging out at the communal den as well, which is quite unusual. I only see Comet. He seems to be the male that's frequent in the den the most. And Saka, I haven't seen in quite some time. Saka used to be the male that was always around. He seems to be the male that's favored the most by the females. Amazing nature. Probably never. She's probably had her time. She was matriarch of the clan and then got severely injured. So Ribbon took this chance to change, to sort of challenge the status quo, change it up and become the matriarch herself. So I highly doubt Corky will ever be in such a position to rise to the top again. I think she'll settle as a low ranker from now on. So the other vehicle is moving, so once they pull out, we'll be able to sort of get a better visual for you. So I mean, never say never, but I really don't believe that Corky will ever be in such a position of strength to be able to challenge that again, challenge Ribbon, who's now huge, and become the matriarch of the clan once again. But you never know. Matriarchal takeovers could be a lot more common than we realize. Now I'm just gonna get, I'm just gonna reposition and then we're gonna be able to get wonderful views of this very, very active moment at the hyena game. We've been hiding behind a tree. Oh, hello everybody. It is so wonderful to see you. Bear with me. Everyone's very hyperactive. No, 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 no. You stay away from my vehicle. Oh, I forgot we had the rain roof on. Have I done a terrible job? Can we manage? Nope, we can't manage. Can you work with this for now? <laughs> I always forget when we have the rain roof on. I'll duck down. 
and then we should be able to get better views. Hello, everybody. No, 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 don't even think about it. <laughs> there we go, Ribbon and her little two. Perfect visuals at last. No sign of Corky's daughter though. So I'm sure you've guessed this already. <laughs> Something went clang under my vehicle. I'm sure you've guessed this already, but we are not going anywhere. Wow. Wow, Tumela, good morning. And welcome to a wonderful and glorious morning here in Swali Kalahari. And we are ranging out west. Good morning, my name is Kyle. Behind camera is Big D. Thumbs up, Big D. We are ranging far out west this morning. And we are heading that way. You can see the way in which our shadows are being cast. Obviously, the sun rising in the east in the southern hemisphere. So that shows us by that shadow position we are ranging west and we're heading out west to try and find those amazing insects i spoke of briefly the other day the leaf cutter bees and as well as the uh, thread wasted wasps very busy at this point in time and hopefully we can get lucky this morning really incredible behavior and it's just there's just lots of them so it's really exciting but you can see that we have changed location in terms of vegetation, in terms of topography. You can see it's very different into what we had yesterday. Yesterday when we were sitting and looking at those beautiful butterflies, those brown veined whites, I just have to add something there that those are the species. So when David was giving us a close and up personal um, view of those beautiful butterflies, those brown veined whites are the species responsible for a three odd thousand kilometer migration through the country from the southern part of the Karoo all the way up into Zimbabwe, which is incredible. Those little organisms traveling so far. It's a very beautiful area and you can see the soil colors changed, the vegetation according and uh, you'll see it becomes more and more flat as soon as we go further west and then what we're going to do is we're going to sit around a watering hole and hopefully we can pick up on one or two little rarities that we don't often see on Swali obviously the time of year and also the location of the pants is just great for a rare bird or two every now and then and then as soon as the heat increases that's when insects become a little more active and then hopefully we can get up close and personal with two very special insects at this point in time. David's wearing two jackets this morning. It's fairly chilly. It's about, about 16 degrees Celsius. Um, but we're looking at hitting the mid and high 30s for today. So lots of animal activity through here. Lots of eelunt. You can see from their very rounded hoof, lots of giraffe and some zebra, a lot of activity of animals. Obviously this being a very important almost highway for these animals moving to and from water. They make these very distinctive trails called game trails or game paths. Obviously animals using it over a very lengthy time they become very defined to and from these water points. I think we're going to catch this one, David. No go. We've already seen two displays of the red crested Koran, and um, it's so at random to try and catch that bird in that display. We're going to have to build a little hide right next to a male and just do a stake out, I think. Birds obviously full in the full swing of dawn chorus. For now, what we're gonna do is continue further west and we're gonna send you off to one of our colleagues and we'll see you back this side. Q. 
here we have one of not the most common but the mouse bird look at him he's got a nice mohawk this is a species of birds that are known for their long tail and they resemble a tails uh, you know a mouse tail that's why they're called mouse birds it's called speckled mouse bird we have other two species in Kenya the blue nipped and the red nipped but this is the most common they have an amazing way of patching and like this you know standing with other birds they sort of hang and they are seed eaters they actually can be a pest when you have tomatoes they love them there's a good number of them there it looks like they are sunning enjoying the morning sun remember they're called speckled mouse birds they do build a nest that looks like a bowl and it's lined nicely with feathers and they lay up to three eggs i haven't seen some in quite a long time but it's nice to see them just patched there and wondering what the morning and the day will bring yeah that beak can really crack seeds yes yeah yawned a little bit maybe <coughs> getting ready to fly it's just so super to see this little guy <laughs> looks like he's a bit worried about something I don't know what Craig and I were driving and going towards the herd buffalo and then we spotted some lion cubs that were sticking out of the bushes close to this dry river barrier and then we just drove a little bit further on to see if we can get a better view of some other lions and then we came upon this lioness with what looks to be some subadult subadult male oh he's got something in his mouth there oh look at that so that's why they've been hanging around here. It's like a warthog's head or something there in his in his in his mouth. One of the subadults that getting up there and walking off to the side and going down into the dry river bed there. So that's definitely Mum sitting up uh, with her face towards us. It seems. Yes, and then. It looks like another subadult male and another one. So there's two. I can just see one's tail sticking out behind the bush there as well. So it seems like the whole pride is here. What a special little find. This area is super productive today, it seems. See, the lioness is actually falling asleep. All the rangers on Pinda have been looking for lions all over the place as we think with the rain and the really dark nights with the cloud cover gives the predators especially these lions such an advantage to stalk animals and prey and then no one knew where they had their carcasses but now it's been solved finding them here and seeing them picking that up and walking down we saw some woolly neck stalks sitting on the ground not far away and almost told us immediately that there might be some carcasses around as they will be trying to scavenge some of that. There the other subadult is up looking at his sibling down in the dry riverbed and he's heading down as well. But this lioness, her head is nice and low so she is definitely falling asleep. So in total, we have seen at least six lions. So we saw two youngsters a little bit further away and then these three subadults and their mother, but I'm sure the youngster's mother is also somewhere around. See how she's actually listening just looking up for a brief moment and her eyes closed now. 
yeah, she's really enjoying this cool weather out in the open like that. You can see one of the sub adults just behind the bush there listening in this direction and like starting to sit up a little bit. You might find if they've been on a big, big carcass, they'll feed a bit and then go and lie down, wait for the food to settle down a bit and then go and feed some more. See how he's listening down into the dry riverbed there. Dr. Rocky Balbo, you're asking where, how do we know where lion's territories start and end? Um, it's not really defined uh, lines where the territories are. I guess where territories of lions come together, um, they tend to overlap just slightly, and that's almost like no man's land, and that's the most dangerous part of their territory. Um, but sometimes, uh, like Jan Pinda, with this particular pride that we're looking at now, there's a mountain range here behind us, and um, a mountain range on almost both sides of their ter territory, and they generally don't go over those mountains. They've been seen over the mountains once or twice, so um, that's the the end of their territory but um, it's often defined by other prides of lions and where those other prides of lions hang around or so and it's a good question because some areas lion territories can be super big and other areas the territories can be a little bit smaller depending on prey movement and also um, other lions obviously in the area uh, just sitting upright and listening down into the dry riverbed there. I think that one sub there on the right hand side might get up soon. Jen, you're asking for what I think is next for this small pride, but just looking at that one sub adult still having quite a big piece of meat in his mouth, um, you can just see him moving around there in the back. I think they are probably going to be around this uh, dry riverbed area for quite a while. They are hidden away from other prey animals, so they don't have to worry about getting alarm call to or buffalo coming to chase them or anything like that. Um, not too far away from water, so I think they're going to be around here for quite a while until the food is done. Maybe till tonight or tomorrow night or so, um, as they can be quite lazy. I'm sure if you've been on safari before and you've seen lions can sleep for long periods of time, especially if their bellies are full, so I think they will probably stick around here for now. I think there's one lioness that was mating with some male lions with the two dominant males of this of this territory a month or two ago so who knows maybe there's some some new cubs on the way It'll be quite interesting to see but uh, these sub adult males also are growing up and within the next year or two they might get kicked out of this pride and need to go and find their own territories and places to 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 get hunt and, and make a living and try and avoid their fathers but for now i think we are going to stick around and we'll see what these lions get up to hopefully they get a move on a little bit oh as i say that she lies down <laughs> Hearts cubs are full of beans. I do not know what they had for dinner last night or possibly breakfast this morning, but full of beans. I think their coffee's been slightly too strong. Did you guys drink Lauren's coffee? Also called jet fuel in camp. Not many can handle it, but they've been running and running and running around and round and round the hyena den fighting. They've been quite rough actually. I've seen more aggression between Hearts Cubs as it stands right now than I ever really witnessed between Shimbulu and Ngwazi. Ribbon's a special matriarch. She really is. They all are. But she... Hello. 
Mm-hmm. Here we go. Here we go. What do you want? She seemed to... There was an aggressive night that we actually managed to let you hear the audio of that happened in camp. The matriarchal takeover where Ribbon decided to conduct the takeover with an army of males, which is highly unusual, happened in our camp. Unfortunately, it was dark, but my whole team were in their pyjamas, which was rather hilarious seeing James Hendry run out in his pyjamas, everybody, to listen to this. And it was blood curling. It was, it was horrible. The screams, the shrills, we knew that something really serious was taking place. And it was, in fact, a matriarchal takeover where Ribbon decided, uh -uh, I'm tired of being a low ranker now, I don't like this. I'm going to conduct a takeover and kick Corky out. June got very injured that day, that's where June's injured um, floppy ear came about. Lots of blood, lots of injuries. But after that, it seemed to settle quite quickly. Corky was injured prior to that and I think she knew I can't maintain this position as matriarch anymore, I'm not fit enough and down to the bottom she went now after that night there was very little aggression I don't see Ribbon being aggressive she does assert her dominance she does make sure that people know not people, sorry, hyenas know that she is a matriarch and they have to respect her but in comparison to what I've seen in the past be it in the Maasai Mara or here in the Juma clan, very 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 little aggression. Tail up, yes, an occasional snarl, chases away the boys. But really, Ribbon's remarkably calm, and I really feel Shimbulu and Ngwazi here are also very calm boys. Now, they're both boys at the end of the day. Males have a sort of different position in a hyena clan than females do, but they're a very calm trio. And I know we were all fond of Corky as a matriarch, and I always will be, but there's something very remarkable and special about Ribbon. I'm just going to lightly tap my car. You need to stop eating cars. Yes, it's not good. And I don't imagine it's yummy. Hearts pair look so different. They've got a full spot pattern now. And of course the female out of this twin litter <laughs> will obviously be more dominant than the male. Now they look very similar. There's more sort of similarity between this pair than there is between Shimbulu and Ngwazi. Okay, the taps are no longer working. Everyone, I do feel like I need to come up with a better method to chase hyenas away from the car. And I imagine at any moment, Corky's little daughter is going to pop her head out saying, Oh, I've just woke up. What's going on? She has a very close bond with Shimbulu and Ngwazi. Very close. We're settling down now. That's jolly good. We're tired. Fabulous. They're all starting to look like mini adults. It's scary how fast they've grown. And if you think of Ribbon's pair, most likely, 97% chance, at least, that they'll disperse. Not right now, of course. But once they get over two years old, they'll go find another clan.
I'm sorry, everyone, but I can feel things being chewed underneath. Our cars are not in the best condition. <laughs> We have aborted the mission of tuning, chewing the car. So we are going to sit tight here with our Drew McClan and we're going to send you lot off to another location. I have the long crested eagle, one of our common eagles here in the Mara, and it's unmistakable. It's not the wind blowing those, uh, those feathers, it is natural, they grow like that. Isn't nature amazing? The long crested eagle pair for life, and this could be a male because males take full duty of taking care of the female if she is incubating some eggs. And once mated, she will sit on the you know on the egg once it hatches, they can hatch up to three eggs. And when the first egg is, is hatched, normally she will sit on the nest while the male feeds her. And when the egg hatches, the young ones are fully fledged in about two months. The duty of feeding them goes to both the adults. They feed on mice, small insects, snakes, you name it that crawls here, they will you know, feed on it. That beautiful beak, look at it. When it's seated like that, it can patch in one spot, and when it's seated like that, it could have spotted something. And so it's waiting for another small move or a mystic from that, whatever it's so, before it goes down and snatches it off the ground. I have talents for doing that job. Usually they make the initial you know, immobilization of whatever they're getting, and then the final blow is done by the beak and when you see them it means the ecosystem is very healthy 
means that there is enough for everybody. He's been there. He's been looking around. I don't know what he spotted, but definitely you can tell. The way he's moving the head, definitely there is something around here. There's always a mouse. There's always a grasshopper or a snake. That's where he is. Good camouflage if you don't know what you're looking for. It's rather got an interesting flight because it's not very big like other eagles and the proportion of the tail to the wings is not you know, a big difference. So when it flies, it looks like a duck. Quite interesting. It's got a white spot on the primaries. So when it flies, you will see it. You'll see the white part of it, of the, of the feathers. I don't know if we have enough time. I might show you in my book how he looks. And, you know, he's been sitting there. He's been quite well behaved because normally they don't stay for very long. But it looks like he knows that I really want to we have a good observation of him. It's right here when you see him, when you have time, Bungay. You can see him on the book. Yeah, it's this one here, long crested eagle. And identifying factor is that, factor is that, that white spot over there. That's how we identify him. He's got a few bars on the tail but the white is mostly how we identify him. On the distribution map, you can tell over here, he's quite well distributed in Tanzania, in Uganda and in Kenya. It's only on the west, western side, all the way down to Tanzania. That's where he's distributed, a long crested eagle. These birds can live such a long time, almost 40 years. It's hard to believe, but they live a very, very long time, up to 40 years. And the young ones are independent from the age of about three years. That's when they really are active. Definitely, it's looking for something. Maybe some breakfast for it. Or maybe it's sunning, it's enjoying the sun. Their eyesight is amazing. They have that binocular vision and they are able. Eh, another yawn. I love it when birds yawn because I've been asked sometimes back if birds yawn. And now I tend to notice it more because it never used to interest me. I thought it was normal. Everybody used to see it, but now I notice it more. And their binocular vision is able to pinpoint something quite long ways, up to around three, four kilometers. And they can fly down there at lightning speeds. So look at him. I don't know if we'll be able to see him hunt. And actually take out whatever it is, a lizard. And the grass, they are able to do that. Quite amazing. It looks like he's still looking. Okay, a little bit of cleanup before doing something else. Well, I'll leave you to enjoy that view and let's take you to another live location. Excuse our poll, but the scenario has just completely done a U-turn, flipped on his head. We are now looking at Corky and her daughter. Now what happened, Ribbon just got up and decided, I've had enough, I'm out of here. I've done enough babysitting, I'm gone. All the previous cubs and Gwazi Shimbulu hearts pair ran off to follow Cor uh, Ribbon. And Corky's daughter appeared from nowhere. They had been at a different den. Or maybe not in a different den, maybe just off in the thicket. And I think that's because Corky didn't want to be here while Ribbon was here.
So Corky moved off to another area and she came here and is so surprised that no one's here. Look at the greetings. She's so happy to see the others and she's still got a very swollen elbow. Her front left is very swollen. We can actually get quite a good view of it now before she moves. There's an interesting greeting ceremony going on here between ex-matriarch and... Who's the cup? I think it's one of hearts. Now, Corky is below heart. Do you see the injury there? So although the cubs are very young, she's still being submissive. This is called a greeting ceremony where we raise our legs and sniff and lick one another's genitals. It's delightful. So Corky arrived and could not believe no one was here. She put her head into the den to look for the other cubs and couldn't find anyone. Oh, oh. We're, we're trying for another greeting ceremony. Hello, hello. Imagine humans greeted each other in this wonderful way. Corky's limping a little bit. It's not too severe, but there's a limp there. <gasps> Ribbons, boys, look at them, acting dominant. <gasps> Ruben flew in to see what's going on. I can't believe this. Well, she obviously didn't fly, but you know what I mean. She heard that. Oh, poor Corky. That's the first time I've seen Ruben's boys exert dominance like that. The tails were up and they bit Corky. Ribbon heard that and immediately ran to see what was going on. Wow. Things mustn't be so good between Ribbon and Corky. If that's Corky moving off to Sacco. But look how Ribbon is with Corky's daughter, though. Now, we first found Shambulu and Gwazi in March. So pretty much the same age as Tandy's son. Not quite nine months yet. So they're the oldest of the gang. And then we found Corky's little one in late June. So that's sort of an estimation oh no no sorry we found him, her in july so we estimate that she was born late june and hearts cubs were actually quite old when we found them i think possibly me I really can't believe what we just witnessed there. Excuse our rain roof pole. <laughs> Corky's still here. I can see her just through the thicket, but we're not going to really be able to get a visual just yet. I don't think we should move, because I'm pretty sure they're going to gravitate back to the den. Yep, she's coming. <clears throat> Excuse me. Oh, Corks, I'm sorry, girl. Corky's limping. I wonder if that injury's got a bit infected. Okay, okay, you see this is an interaction here, a greeting ceremony. I think it's in Gwazi and Corky. Do 
You see how those two boys were able to exert dominance over her like that? And that's because they're the matriarch's sons. Corks has not had an easy ride, has she? But she's still very much part of the clan. She's a key player. She's only one of five females. Since we lost Pretty, there's only five. Ribbon, Intima, Heart, June, and Corky. Now I can't see where Cox has gone, but if she if she's definitely leaving, we will of course have to leave. Shimbulu and Ngwazi's legs don't quite look like they fit the body. And you can see how fluffy they are. As they get older, they lose that fluffiness. And it's only recently that Sutu, June's daughter, we saw yesterday, has started to lose that fluffiness. She's also really changing physically. Ulrich, you're asking, how is the matriarch replaced? Well, it's not the same as elephants because hyenas have a hierarchy. So it's not necessarily the, the oldest female in the group. And there can be takeovers. So that's what's happened here. Corky was at the top and then Ribbon conducted a matriarchal takeover. She saw opportunity and therefore there was change. But if Ribbon was to, if we were to lose her, which hopefully will not happen, then it's the next dominant one the next in line in the hierarchy that would most likely take her place. But again, there could be a battle. Hearts always seem to be in a very good position near the top of the clan. But if we were to lose Ribbon, I imagine Intima, her daughter, Sorry, I'm just watching this battle between this pair. I imagine Intima, her daughter, would step up to the mark, but she could be challenged. But because she's the matriarch's daughter, she's also very high rank. She's in a really good position in this clan in Tima. She's also young. She's also strong. Very little injuries. Corky's daughter's been a little terror here. It's like watching the wrestling. Ouch. But this clan's been through a lot, a lot of turbulence, a lot of instability. So I really hope that Ribbon can maintain her position. The clan can settle, the cubs can grow, more cubs can come. We need more females. As I mentioned, males leave. They become sort of immigrants and new clans. And therefore we need females. Hart's got a daughter and Corky's got a daughter. And although Corky's daughter will be low ranked, we need females, we need the clan to grow. Five is a very low number. Although it's a small clan, Indibele and Sutu, are also females. I haven't seen Indabelli in quite some time, but they will also add to the pool of females. Swazi, unfortunately, will disperse. I would imagine. Although 3% of males are said to stay, he could be one of the 3%. He's rather special that way. Okay, I can't see Corky, everyone. I'm gonna to have to turn around and make sure that she is definitely gone. I think she has, which means we have to leave the hyena den, I'm afraid, but it's definitely been an absolutely fantastic morning. So goodbye, little cubbies. I will come and check on you later on.
Good morning and welcome here back in the Mara. The hyenas are super playful and here we have three lionesses and these are from the breakaway pride. They broke away from the river pride. The reason I saw these lions here is because there was a water buck who looked very suspicious staring at this direction. And the baboons were actually barking. So it seemed like there was a leopard close by because the baboons were looking scared, frightened, up in the tree. So driving here, I found this lioness is sleeping. You can tell she's up to something by the way she's looking, she's scanning around. It looks like she, they were on the move because at this very spot, it's very hard for game to see them here especially the, the planes game. So probably they were walking and then came to that spot to rest. She on the move again. Maybe she wants a spot to rest. So that is one of the youngsters, she's about two years old. About three weeks ago, their mother was mating Kibogoyo, and Kibogoyo comes from this Bilashaka coalition, the males that hang around Bilashaka area, and Musiara Marsh. for a drink. So before lions get to eat, they always drink water regularly. And sometimes maybe early in the morning like what you see. And I've seen also drinking late afternoon or in the evening. If they don't go on a hunt right now, they just pick a spot where they'll rest. And then maybe mid morning because wildlife will come to drink here at this water hole here on this marsh. So they might try and hunt later. You can see she's a little bit skinny. So that tells you that she's not eaten for a little while. That one was super thirsty. It's almost taking about a minute before raising her head. was a nice drink. Are you going to rest now? So these lands have six residents here and the reason I'm saying the six residents here is because we are not far from the Mugoro Pride area. But once in a while they head back to the River Pride area. So I think this 
will be their permanent residence. So forming that small territory, small fried area. Croton bushes form a very good hiding place for lions because they are insect repellent. That is the way they always like sleeping inside there. So if someone else come or passes around here, they'll definitely not see la that lion in the bushes. So when it rains, lions make it find it difficult to go for hunt because the prey keeps on moving around and sometimes they will resolve to hunting rather diff some very difficult game to hunt. I've seen them digging on warthog burrows to just to flush out the warthogs. So that is the reason you can see that these lionesses are skinny, so it means that they've not gone for food. I'm just going to keep an eye and watch what they will be doing next as I take you over to another live location. We're back here with our feisty young male impalas. A few adults there teaching the youngsters what to do. They've just taken a bit of a break. You've got to, you've got to eat, keep the energy levels up when you're doing so much sparring. They're just taking a break now, actually in anticipation of the rain that might uh, that might arrive soon. It's a bit of a wind that's just picked up. I don't know if you can hear that coming through the microphone. It's a very still morning, but all of a sardine. There's a a strong gust that's just pushing through and I can see a bit of a wall of grey approaching us. So these impala as well as a few zebras did uh, you know walk towards the thicket there where they might get a little bit more uh... oh goodness gracious me so that's how strong the wind is we can't even hear what's happening. I'm gonna try and just make it work a bit better. I don't know if that'll work. I'm trying my best. Um, but yeah they will move to the thickets because uh, because of this wind. It's quite a chilly one and there's also potential rain coming. So they're all moving there to try and get out of it. So they are small animals, well, relatively small animals. Is that any better, BK? Is that a bit better? Yeah. And uh, yeah, so if they stay in this wet, cold wind and rain, it's actually slowly going to start cooling them down. And that's not great for them. They need to keep their energy levels up. They don't want to waste all their energy trying to keep their body warm. But all's calm now. Actually, sparring would have been a really good way to keep themselves nice and warm. Surprised they've stopped. Would have been a very cold and uncomfortable night for them. You know, impalas are basically on the menu for almost every single animal that's a predator, from jackals, which are quite small, all the way up to lions, which are obviously the largest. And so they would have been, last night, very nervous with all the thunder and lightning, wind and drizzle that was coming down. So. It's a good day for them to relax a bit, let off some steam after the tension of the night. See that one there is having a bit of a grooming session. Also important to keep yourself free of parasites, of which there are plenty. Some of our students went out to uh, do a bit of a bushwalk and came back covered in all sorts of pepper ticks, which are basically the nymph stage of ticks, the baby ticks. They were covered in them, loads and loads of them. So where there are lots of animals like these impala, you inevitably find lots and lots of ticks. And so they also have to keep grooming themselves to make sure that they stay healthy. Now, animals can deal with a certain amount of ticks, but too many ticks will have a huge effect on their health if they get a too high a tick load. So you'll often see an, an antelope also grooming each other to help with that. These impala are taking advantage of the, the sheltered environment over there, the longer grass that's growing, much more nutritious than that which is growing in the open. 
just nibbling away. And at this angle, you can actually see those lovely markings on the back of an Apollo, those stripes, the black stripes on the pale fur. And that's typical follow me sign, helping Impalas to follow each other when they are running from danger or even just moving through a thicker environment. But there's another theory that I've, that I've heard, I've done a bit of reading up about it. When it's warm and the sun is shining, the dark fur attracts the, the, the sunlight, obviously it absorbs the heat and uh, it gets warmer there. And when you are warm, your blood vessels come to the surface which makes it easier for the ticks and parasites to get to, which means they all crowd onto those black markings on the back of an impala. And that, incidentally, is a place where they can reach fairly easily and comfortably. So it helps to be able to remove most of the ticks from their body because they all congregate there where the blood is close to the surface. Isn't that clever? I can't say that that's the only reason. Definitely a follow me sign as well, but one of the theories that I've, that I've read up on. That makes sense to me. Definitely makes sense. Absolutely all of the Impala at the moment are with their heads down feeding. Obviously they feel very comfortable that there are no predators around. There are lots of Impalas around. There are at least maybe 30 that I can see. This is that same group that we had yesterday. It's exactly the same spot, in fact. They haven't moved at all. It's still Probably a good 50 or 60 of them in this area. They, impalas breed, so there's two stages to the breeding. There's the, the mating and there's the giving birth. And they have a, a gestation of about seven, seven months. So these males will start their rutting season around about April going into May. So late April, early May, these impalas, these males will be fighting over dominance of herds of females. Then what will happen is most of the females should be impregnated within a few weeks of each other. Oh, there's, there's hyenas calling in the distance. Just want to try and figure out if it's like an excitement call. I don't know if you guys can hear that with all the wind. I doubt it. Not particularly far, though. Might go and investigate that in a moment. But then the, the female impalas will give birth right now. We're starting to see them giving birth right now. Nice. You could hear the call. That's great. Hopefully you all heard that. So it's not so far, but the wind is quite, quite strongly blowing. So we'll go and investigate that in a moment and see if there's anything that's caught the attention of the hyenas. But yeah, all the impalas are giving birth right now. So they, breeding season, April, May, the mating and rutting and fighting. November, December is the giving birth. So the cycle is almost complete. And then these males will all mix into mixed herds with the females. And then around about April, May, they start fighting again, splitting off into bachelor groups like what we see here. I hope that made sense. I feel like I, I explained the long way around that story. Well, the impalas didn't seem to be too alarmed by by the hyenas calling. It stopped now. There's just one hyena that called four or five times, and then it stopped. So I wonder if maybe maybe it was just a contact call. Like maybe they were one of the hyenas had been off foraging last night, hunting, and had now come back or to the area and was just announcing to the rest of the clan that, hey, I'm back, I'm on my way. Because, you know, there's a den down there somewhere. I'm not exactly sure where it is. They've moved it recently. And when they approach a den site, you can often find a lot of the adults get a bit like nervous. The youngsters all run away and they hide because they just see a hyena and they don't know what it is, who it is, rather. So by announcing their presence, they are basically letting the others know, don't worry, it's just me, I'm on my way back, I'll be there soon. So nice, just nibbling away at this grass with all the oh, the moisture on it. So fresh and clean, you know, when, when it's dusty and, and dry, everything gets covered in this layer of dust, and it's not so pleasant, I'm sure. But now it's nice and clean.
region, they absolutely do. They absolutely do land on the impalas to feed on the ticks. Right now it's very cold. A lot of the oxpeckers will probably be in their nests, you know, in the cavities and the holes in the trees. But I have seen a few out already this morning. I can't remember what we saw earlier. Maybe some impala. June. It was a giraffe. You're right. It was a giraffe, PK. And we saw a couple of oxpeckers sitting on the giraffe. But it's not going to be happening as much today as it would on a nice warm day. Because it's very windy and it's cold. There's a bit of drizzle. It's not pleasant for a bird. But I'm sure if we scanned this group, you know, there's you know, a good 40, 50, maybe even 60 impalas around here. I'm sure we would find at least one oxpecker busy combing its bill through the fur, picking up not only ticks, region, not only ticks do they eat, but also uh, dead skin cells, other insects that might be around. We've seen oxpeckers landing on the ground and picking up insects from the ground, as well as the, the body fluids, the blood and plasma of animals that are injured. We told you that story about the buffalo not long ago, who had basically snapped off his horn almost completely was just hanging off and there was so much blood coming from his horn and the oxpeckers were attacking it ferociously which must have been very uncomfortable for that buffalo it kept shaking its head trying to chase the, the oxpeckers off it's very interesting oxpeckers can fulfill so many different roles on on antelope they can be parasites you know feeding on wounds which is not great they can be beneficial taking away the ticks so and, and parasites and other things and then they can also just be using the impalas and other animals for warmth not providing them any benefits or service but literally just sitting on them trying to keep warm here's a group of oxpeckers right now coming in i think a whole group of birds it could be oxpeckers though it could, could also be buffalo weavers Let's see there's a group of birds flying over let's just see do they land no i don't think so i think there might have been something else but that's quite typical when you see flock of birds like that flying low down they'll often come and land on the on the impalas it's a good thing to look out for if you're on a walking safari if you see an oxpeck in the distance calling and then it just descends very rapidly into the into the bushes in front of you it's a good idea to be very wary because there could be something like a buffalo up ahead it could be a warthog so they don't only land on the big hairy scaries it's good to be vigilant. In fact, with our students, it's one of the, the first things we teach them on their trails guide portion of their course. We'll say to them, every time you see an oxpecker or hear an oxpecker, we want you to raise your hand and say oxpecker, so that we can see that you're being very alert, because it is really one of the most important signs to look out for, to avoid conflict with something like a rhino or a buffalo, which have oxpeckers frequently around them. breakfast delicious see that got a big mouthful of food and then immediately looked up and around just to keep an eye out everything in nature is about survival if you are not paying attention if you are not vigilant you will be eaten Here comes the wind picking up again seems like that sort of cloud bank and the, the rain that we could see in the distance is moving just slightly past us to our, our eastern side. So that's good. It's good for us. It means we can stay out and drive. But the environment does need a bit more rain. That impala seems to be being bothered by something. Its tail is flicking quite a lot. It's constantly flicking. You see that? It even ran off. It must have been something that was uncomfortable, like an insect, a tick, or parasite, or something, a biting thing, which is really frustrating it. You see most of the other impalas aren't even flicking their tails at all, but that one is freaking out. There's definitely something bothering it. This one here hasn't even shivered or flicked its tail even once. It's healthy well-groomed impala ram. Oh, got a bit of a fright there. Something gave it a fright. Well, they all seem to be moving further into the thickets. Perhaps we should do the same and we'll move off and see what else we can find. Oh, no. 
Uh, you just came back as the lioness just picked her head up a little bit. We are still waiting to see if they'll maybe get a move on or so. Seems like they've settled down for quite a bit now. There's a few of the youngsters that are still chewing on something there in the background. Like the, we saw that one getting up earlier with a piece of meat or like the head of the warthog or so. And it seems like they're still chewing away. And I wonder if they've been in this dry river bed for quite a while. And maybe while they were sleeping or so, they can be super, super opportunistic. And I think that while they were resting for the evening a, or for the morning, a water maybe came into its burrow or out of its burrow close by. And then uh, they just caught it there. You just see the female sitting up briefly. I think there's a lot of flies and stuff around. So as we know that they, they've they been missing for quite a while. So I think they've been in this area for a little bit on a carcass, like we said. And I think there's maybe some biting flies or so around. That's why she's maybe sitting upright like that. Her three suburb male cubs are just spread out into the dry river bed next to her there. We can see their ears every now and then. We're still here. Ribbon was in fact here all along, which means we don't have to leave. Now, I have to apologize. It was not Ribbon's cubs in Gwazi and Shimbulu that asserted dominance over Corky there. I don't think I drank enough jet fuel this morning. And I'm out of practice with this clan. I'm sorry, it's a whir of spots. It was hearts too. Thank you, Michael Fleet Fleetwood, for that uh, clarification, which actually makes more sense. I don't know why I didn't think of that. Hearts pair, male and female, haven't got names yet, seem to be very, very aggressive, not just with one another, but with others. And heart, we guess, sits at number three on the hierarchy. So, of course, it's Ribbon at the top, and then naturally it's her daughter and Tima, who's now an adult, and then it's Heart. Heart has always been a sort of mid-ranker, if you like, but she's always had a good relationship with Ribbon and, and Tima. And there's a fantastic paper, you can find it online, by Kay Holkamp and team, and it's about social alliances within hyenas and how they must have alliances, a.k.a friendships. I say that loosely. But normally you will find certain hyenas are closer to one another than others. And I think Ribbon and Corky are not close at all. And not just from the takeover, but historically, I don't think they've had a good relationship. But yet, Ribbon has a great one with Heart. So Heart's also in a very good position. Obviously, I do not hear what they hear. That's a nice full belly you've got there, girl. Oh, Scorky Scub, she scared them all. <laughs> okay, let's watch this interaction. A tiny little cub initiating a greeting ceremony with the matriarch. Cannot contain her excitement. Too excited. Oh, didn't last long. But yes, that makes more sense that it was Heart's pair and they really, really were aggressive to Corky, who's an adult. Yes, the lowest ranker, but that was a fascinating, fascinating encounter. Sorry, I got it wrong. Everybody's got spots now, including Heart's daughter. I can't handle it. You're getting too big. Did you see Ribbon there? That was Ribbon interacting with Corky's daughter. There was no aggression. Ribbon let her sniff and lick and do her thing and whatever is part of a greeting ceremony.
Susanna, not at all, not at all. Low rankers don't get prime access to food. They often have to survive on scraps or have to go and find their own meals. They are the lowest ranker. They do get bullied and food is one of those things that they definitely don't get the best access to. So naturally, Corky's daughter, being the lowest ranker's daughter, will feel those effects. Now, many of you were worried, worried, worried about Corky's daughter. She's so small, but look at her. She's absolutely thriving. And that's because in nature, everything is everything strives for balance. It doesn't mean that everything's always in balance, but it strives for balance, just as our bodies. Everything in our body strives for balance. And if you're a low ranker, it cannot be possible that you cannot produce viable offspring you're still part of the clan you're not a solitary animal so although Corky doesn't get treated the best she's still fundamental to the Juma clan they need her that's why Ribbon tolerates her that's why she still hangs around so therefore it cannot be possible that the lowest ranker cannot produce viable offspring that won't survive there has to be an offset Nature has to have some sort of system in place that even although you're at the bottom of the clan, you still survive and thrive. And that offset comes in the milk production. So although you won't or you haven't seen Corky feeding her daughter as much as Ribbon, she does feed her daughter and it's said to be that when she does, that milk that she produces is not only in large quantities at the one time, it's of higher nutritional quality than Ribbon's because it's been stored for a little while. Higher in fatty acids, higher in protein, higher in calcium, and all the minerals and amino acids that a little cub requires. Whereas Ribbon feeds her boys almost every day. So the milk will not be in as large quantities and is said to not be as nutritious. And this comes from a fantastic paper. So that's nature's way of offsetting for the fact that you are a low ranker, but you are still going to produce strong, viable offspring to support the clan. Hyenas wouldn't have such a social structure if the lowest rankers were not able to survive. I hope that makes sense. But she's thriving, she's small. But then if you look at humans, we come in all different shapes and sizes as well. So while we are enjoying this perfect moment, we are introducing you to, of course, the Explorer Program, Wild Earth Explorer Program, which is extremely exciting. And it's a subscription, basically, that you can sign up to. And there's all sorts of offerings on there. So please do check it out. You can have an opportunity to subscribe and you can find out all the information, far more than I'm giving right now, on our website, wildearth.tv slash explorers please head over there and check it out. This is the longest time I've spent at the hyena den in a very, very long time, everyone. Now, I didn't quite see where Hart's pair went. I'm guessing they must have scuttled back into the den. Exhausted, and we've seen no signs of heart. I'm sure she's possibly following a leopard. It was fascinating. We actually had Klalamba yesterday, but we were the silent safari, so of course Trishala came in. But what we were able to observe was Klalamba was found because she was sawing. She was being so vocal, you could hear it. So we located her, and then about 10 metres behind her was Sutu. Sutu had heard this noise and immediately followed Klalamba because she knows leopards equal food really fascinating behavior and i think it's learned behavior from the spotty hyenas in the sabi sands it's not innate it's learned behavior that's passed down through generations leopards equal food leopards equal a free meal 
with a little bit of gravity thrown into the mix. <laughs> Corky's daughter can't sit still. She's also full of beans. So as long as Rib Rob stays here, we are also going to sit here to watch the dynamics of the Juma clan. Okay, guys, um, something very, very interesting. I didn't plan this, but looks like elephants are going on a jog this morning. Look at this. I don't know what's going on. They've just decided to go for it. Yeah, they were, it was a very big herd. Something happened, they split, and then there was a bit of trumpeting, and uh, now again they're, you know, running. It's just unbelievable. <laughs> Quite, it's a lot of fun. Disease. So taking it out in the plains, yes, quite funny indeed. They are still going. I don't know what discussion they had, or they just, just decided to go for a sprint, burn off some calories. It will be nice, you know, to just try and catch up. I don't know if we'll be able to hold on to that screen. Let's try and catch up, but they're still going. It's quite interesting. I don't know exactly what triggered it, and I didn't plan it because I have been watching them for more than half an hour. They came crossed in front of the vehicle, and all of a sudden, there was just this urge to get away from that area or to go somewhere, and they're still going. I was hoping that you know they're going to wallow because there's a few wallowing holes here. That was my plan, but now it looks like uh, everybody is taking off. Look at that, they're still going. Now they stopped a little bit at a distance. I don't know if it's the sound of my vehicle, but they've stopped. But it's a long line of them. They're stretched out over there. They're still going, look at that. Yeah, the little ones have been put in the middle. Nothing spooked them, there was no lion. They knew I was there, they're still going. <laughs> I can hear a little bit of trumpeting. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what's going on. They just decided to have fun in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> it looks like, you know, you don't go past me, that mom said. They're still going. I don't know how far they're gonna go. This is the late uh, last one. <laughs> yeah, I think he's listening to the direction where everybody has gone. And then catch up. You're very late, buddy. Catch up. Whatever it is, I've never seen something like that. And if I have, maybe I've forgotten, but. <laughs> So there was nothing. They just decided, decided to, you know, to um, run for it. They were comfortable. They were running, and now all of a sudden they've frozen. Many of them are frozen. Uh, they started moving again. Quite interesting. Yeah, they're frozen again. Thank you for your comment. 
Yeah, running baby elephants are very cute. Well, I don't know how to put it, but it was very entertaining. And it's not always about, you know, seeing them feeding, wallowing, but also take a run for it out in the middle of the plains. Uh, it's quite fun. Yeah, I'm gonna have to try and catch up with them. I was hoping I was gonna stay with them for a little bit longer, but I think they've decided otherwise, you know, to leave me in a haste. Maybe they read my mind, you know. I was really looking forward to following them for the next maybe 25 minutes and see what they do because it was one very big herd. I'm gonna try and stop here somewhere and while I do that, let's take it to another live location. Welcome back to this side of the matter where our elephants from this particular direction have started walking towards the marsh and you can see the little calf is super playful running up around. So every day this is what happens, the activity increases especially when they're just emerging out of the little forest there. That tiny one has a very busy morning. You can see how he's running. So from, from this particular area, we have about six families that always come from this escarpment and walk just to where we are crossing the road and walking into the marsh eat a little bit of some reeds in the marsh and then go into the forest and I think they always cross the Mara River and head to the other side. Now that the water level is low, it's easy for them just to cross the Mara River. Grazing or eating on the grass here has become the highest feeding opportunity here because there's lots of water. We have the short November, November, December rains, so it's easy for them just to pluck the grass and eat. But we find that during the droughts, elephants will resolve to eating leaves and peeling off branch barks from the trees, breaking branches, because the calves cannot reach that high. So you find that most of the time they'll fall, fall down trees, they'll break branches and give it to the, the calves for them to feed on the leaves. This looks like a small family, but I'm still hoping and expecting to see more families. We have family members consist of about 25, 30. So it's always nice when you see them walking out of that forest into the open. also drink daily so we find that just about now they'll head to a place where they'll drink and then carry on to grazing and then late afternoon they'll also go back to, to drinking mud wallowing mud bathing sanding and then come back to this open savanna and head back to the escarpment what happened yesterday from the giraffe crossing so 
the giraffe managed to cross and the zebras managed to cross as well. So I think the giraffe is what that prompted the zebras to make it because he was walking slowly and actually got to the, to the middle of the river. The zebra started walking again. So they all, they met at the center and the zebra got spooked by crocodiles, making them run. So the, the, the giraffe also did the same sped off to the opposite direction. It was very nice watching that. Unfortunately, we could not put that on live, but good news is no zebra was killed. Actually, there's one big stallion that wrestled between, he was caught up with four, four crocs. Actually, even went submerged into the water, but wrestled his way up, busting up and sped off from the water. That was a super intense moment. So yes, the giraffe managed to cross. I'm going to sit here watching these elephants, expecting more elephants to come out of the forest and also looking forward to head to the river and see if we have zebras gathering at the river point as I take you over to another live location. Well, from more elephants to one of the most mistaken little carnivores of the African plains. I have the silver-backed or the black-backed jacko. These are four puppies. These are not the original three or two that got left. This is another family. It has been very, very shy, but today they look much more relaxed. I don't know if that bit of grass that is, you know, actually blocking them from us or us from to them is making them comfortable. I don't know really what. Amongst these four, there is one who lost its tail. Still a mystery because normally if it's um, been cut off by a predator, it's half, but this one is completely off. It's amongst one of those. And this is a perfect um, litter because they've done really, really well. Four to survive is quite, you know, lucky. I'm saying maybe still not all of them will make it, but they are doing really, really well. Jackals have got huge home ranges and they wander around eating whatever is available from carrion to berries, insects, and even birds. Even small reptiles, they're not fussy. They will eat them. Equipped with big ears, they are able to detect movements in the long grass. And uh, that's how also they protect themselves because having those big ears, you know, it's an advantage because you're too small and cannot actually put up a fight so you need to listen to your enemy approaching you to get away their eyesight is amazing and also sense of smell is very very good they can be active any time of day day and night but mostly early morning and evening you can see you might not see me really well but those ears are pointed towards where i am today is amazing because they're very relaxed I'm very, very surprised. Normally they take off every time I get close to them. Well, jackals bear for life. That is in adults. And they're very vocal if they need to. They have a call that is so loud it can be heard almost a kilometer. 
And when you hear it, usually it's either they're contacting one another or they're warning everybody who's around of presence of either a lion or a leopard. They don't like them. They're always trying to tell everybody, get away. And it's such a loud call. It goes like, quack, quack, quack. Yeah, it goes something like that. And usually you see them facing towards danger, just like how they're doing it right now. Trying to figure out exactly what I want here. I have seen an increase in jackals over the last years. And I think just like everything else is doing well, they are doing really, really well. It's not the only kind of jackal we get here. We have the side-striped jackal, much more rare, but solitary. They wander around alone. This, you know, silverback, the one we're looking at, they pair for life. And the, you know, the parents wander long distances in search of food, either scavenging or killing, and they'll bring it back to these guys they are still dependent on the adults until the age of around six months. Right now, they're about three. Normally, you'd find them somewhere much drier. They love the roads, they love termite mounds. But here looks like, you know, they are really enjoying that spot. I don't blame them. But in case of any threat, they will quickly dash towards one of the bushes that's close here. And I think that's where they've been hiding. I think that one that's still seated is not very sure of me. I think it's the one without the tail. He has always been the one that is very inquisitive, interested in vehicles or trying to judge if to get away or stay. Don't know if I position slightly we'll be able to see a body yeah not very clear, clear still but you can tell it's a jackal This is an animal that has been prosecuted over the years for carrying the disease rabies. Wherever it appears in a village or close to a town, they say that it takes the disease to the domestic dogs. And I don't know how true is that. Yes, they're very small, as you can see, but these guys can run much faster than we do, and they have endurance. They can run quite fast, and also they can turn at very sharp angles. That's how they get away from other predators. Apart from that, they play a very big role, making sure that all the carcasses that would be littering the plains and spreading disease is taken care of. Must be a lot of work for a mother of four or parents of four, because it's a lot of mouths. Right now they're not drinking, they're just eating. Yeah, that one has been just sitting, making sure that I don't get out of the vehicle or I'm not dangerous. I think that's the one without a tail, definitely. I don't know how that will affect him, 
but it might affect him quite a lot. Running and turning at very sharp angles, he might lose balance. So I think it's a disadvantage. So he might end up being, a, you know, more of a scavenger than a killer. Because chasing something and then it turns, he might lose hope of catching anything. Because every time he chases, the animal turns, he'll either flip or roll, fall down. Maybe might end up not hunting live animals. While foraging, these guys can wander very long distances when ready because they pair for life after mating the female usually finds a spot where it's a burrow a rocky crevice that's where they give birth or a very thick undergrowth they make an entrance and they don't actually they don't line it with anything they just give birth they give birth to up to six and they carry them for just about nine months sorry, three months, they carry their young and usually they stay in the burrow until they're about... No, it's not the stumpy one. That's a different one. Yeah, I thought it was the tailless one. They stay in the burrow for quite a while, you know, up to two months. Every time, you know, every time they're, they're happy, they will get out. You'll see them. They usually look very cute, even cuter than how they look right now. I'm really, really liking this because... These guys have been eluding us since we saw them. And this is not the first litter that we used to see. This is a different one. Let's see. Relax a little bit. There they are. All four. How cute is that? We're still sitting here enjoying this extremely precious moment. Normally both cubs fight over this sort of top position. Shimbulu's in the top here and Gwazi's underneath. But they just settled it amongst themselves. There's very little sort of aggression between this pair. I think it's because they're both males. They don't really... Males don't really have a hierarchy in the same way females do. Once you immigrate to a new clan, you do start at the bottom of the pile and you sort of earn your way up by being very submissive to the females, showing commitment for a long period of time. Tenure is important. But if you stay, then who you are, what silver spoon you were born with, what gives you your rank. So if this pair stay, they'll still be in a very good position they won't get to meet with any of the females, but they probably still will be able to assert dominance over other females and get good access to food. But mating will be an issue. But if they go, their entire world is going to flip upside down. They will no longer be at the top. They will be at the very, very bottom. There'll be new immigrant males to whichever clan they join. And they'll have to slowly, slowly prove themselves as loyal, submissive, and I don't think that's easy, coming into a new clan of hyenas and proving yourself. So we've just had a break in the weather. We've had some beautiful rain this morning. And what do we find lying on the road but the Birmingham Pride? Absolutely stunning morning here at and beyond Ongala. And we've actually got 13 members of the Birmingham Pride here. We've got both of the white ones, the one right in the middle of the frame and the far left. 
some of the older lionesses there underneath the quarry trees. So that female's actually one of my favorites. She's one of the older females and she's incredibly large. Look at the size of those shoulders. Even her paws are big. But the nice thing about this this morning is that it's so nice and cool. So they're actually a bit more awake than what you would find on a hot day. So she's quite alert, looking around, listening. So they don't need to be hiding away, which is very, very lucky because I love sitting with the Birmingham Pride. It's the first Pride of Lions that I met coming to and beyond Angola before the times of the White Lions and the Birmingham Pride. And we've got two of the smallest little youngsters here, the cubs. Watching us closely, you can see the one ear moving, very alert. I love how they lie like that with one paw facing up and one on the ground. Seems to be a very lion thing to do. <laughs> so some of these lions are very sleepy. But that young white female has been quite alert this morning. You can see she's looking up into the sky for vultures and eagles. And the way that she's actually looking, she's been looking off into the distance like that every few minutes. And I think it's because there are some zebras in the distance. We can't see them very well but they can definitely hear them. <laughs> and then she goes back to sleep. So one of my favorite things about this particular lioness is the color of her eyes. And her size is incredible compared to the other lions and cubs of the same age. She's incredibly beautiful. There's the young white male. His mane is growing incredibly nicely now. And they're actually looking quite nice and clean this morning. Other than around his mane, he looks a bit darker. But you can really see that white very nicely. And he's got quite a lot of scarring on the face. And actually, when you compare it to the other youngsters of this pride, the white ones have got a lot more scars than the others. And it's not because they know that they're different or the others know that they're different necessarily. I think it's actually more just their personalities. Both of these white ones are quite outgoing and they can be quite feisty as well. Especially at a carcass. <laughs> but he looks like he's having a very nice time relaxing, grooming his mane. always been one of my favorite things to watch is how a lion is able to groom itself. They're so flexible. But it's also very cute when they can groom each other. see the few that are alert are definitely all looking in the same direction. I think they're hearing those zebras. Maybe even smelling them. The wind is actually blowing towards the lines from the direction of the zebras. You can see those whiskers really nicely. Wow. <laughs> I think that's always been something that's fascinated me is the whiskers and the beard of a lion. They, lions can definitely get toothache. Um, it actually happens quite a lot for them. So especially if um, one of the Ross males, you can see some of the older lionesses, if they break a canine, it actually opens the canal that goes into the tooth and down to the root. So it can be very sensitive, so much so that they actually will not eat for a while because it hurts a lot when you touch on that nerve. So they can definitely get toothache. There are forms of flus that animals can get. There is a cat flu and sometimes they do tend to sneeze or cough a bit or have a bit of a, a runny nose or even runny eyes. Um, 
but we don't see it that often. It's not something that we've noticed a lot in wild lions. They're much more prone to things like tuberculosis. So there's a bovine tuberculosis that's transmitted by buffaloes. If they eat those buffaloes that have bovine tuberculosis, tu tuberculosis, they can get that. And then it becomes more evident with coughing because it attacks the lungs. But I can't say I've seen a lot of lions with flu, the way that we experience flu. Um, but you even get feline AIDS. So there's a whole array of diseases and infections that they can get. I think one of the worst for them here is definitely toothache though, because with fighting, with feeding, with all sorts of things, as lions are in nature, they will defend their territories and fight, especially at carcasses. It is quite likely that they might break a tooth, especially a canine, those long ones you see right in the front. So yes, I would think toothache would be quite bad for them, especially especially the bigger, older lions that have more broken teeth than the younger ones. <laughs> but that's a really good question. You can see they have eaten something. Their stomachs are not empty. They're rounded, especially the younger males have all got a bit more food in their bellies, which is normal. The males tend to eat first. Even these younger ones are already starting to show their power and try and assert dominance over the lionesses. You can see his mane there starting to grow nicely. So he's actually one of the closer relatives of the white male. They're around the same age. I know a lot of people have been asking recently about the Birmingham young male, the one that was so badly injured at the beginning of this year and he's actually been doing very well we have seen him every now and then with the pride he is actually here today and he's been doing very well he's still got a slight limp um, but he's keeping up with the pride he's got more than enough food coming from them especially now we know that the ross males are not here so those are the times we tend to see him with the pride in particular because they are not chasing him out if they're not around and so he'll come back and bond with his half siblings and with his mum and his aunt and his sister as well because she's the mum of the two very young cubs but if you have a look behind this white male that's him there you can see he's got a full belly you can see the mane is fuller and he's actually doing very well he's in very good condition Personally, I was quite worried when I saw how injured he was a few months ago, and I really didn't know if he was going to make it, but he has been a fighter since day one, since he, he was much younger. So I always believed and hoped that he might make it, and he's just completely blown us away with his tenacity. He doesn't give up. It's very unusual for him to still be with the pride, but it kind of makes sense if you're the only male of that age. <laughs> it almost looks like that one is. It's trying to be alert, but it's almost fighting sleep. What I love about these little ones, especially at that age, is all those spots. They are born with so many spots when they're young and they only really start to go away from about two and a half years old. They start to fade. So I think I'm gonna sit here for a little bit longer, see maybe they might start moving just now. Oh, yawn. <laughs> and just enjoy seeing the Birmingham Pride. We had a beautiful giant plated lizard for you, but I'm afraid it has popped back down into its termite mound. We have left Ribbon and her little ones, so it's time to just let them rest without the sound of my voice in their ear. And where we're headed is to the nest of the Hillmick Shrikes, because I have a really wonderful story to tell you on what we observed yesterday, but sadly, 
I couldn't speak yesterday, so therefore I wasn't able to share it with you. So we're just going to bumble along to that nest and see if it's active. And then I can share with you our fascinating findings. Apparently there was five chicks at the start. There's only three now, so there's obviously been a loss of two. And they're getting bigger and bigger. I don't think that nest can really hold any more chicks if they continue to get bigger. I think Corky was resting at den number two, believe it or not. Okay, so we're heading to that nest and hopefully those little chickies will be having breakfast. We were also watching some chicks before, but they've moved off. We're just also just looking at this foam nest frog nest here at Leopard Dam. Whilst the geese goslings have moved off and we can't see them anymore. It's a wonderful morning here at, at Leopard Dam. It's actually very quiet. You can hear lots of birds twittering away. And the birds that you can hear twittering away are these very cool red billed buffalo weavers that are busy building all their nests. having issues with the wind again. Not much I can do about it, it is a very windy day. But hopefully you guys can all hear me. I don't know if you can see those red-billed buffalo weavers over there. They are very active this morning, more active than I've seen them in a long time. Perhaps it's a bunch of males that are trying to entice females to their nest holes. I'm not 100% sure. You can't really tell the males and females apart. And I've not really been able to figure out the social dynamics of that group because they all look exactly the same. But there's heaps of them as you can see there and they're very active. I'm sure there's a lot of courtship happening. Love is in the air. Oh, speaking of, of birds and courtship and love being in the air, there's another bird which has come here to South Africa, which is not common, or not necessarily common, it's, it's a migrant, so we don't see it. We've only just started seeing it now. It's a woodland kingfisher. I wanted to show you one, just flew across the, the dam a moment ago and landed. Not so far from where these buffalo weavers are, but can't see it now. It's a real shame because it's a spectacularly pretty bird. Bright blue colors with a dark, dark eye strip and some wing feathers and very bright turquoise blue feathers along its back. Man, I love those feathers. I, love, I can't wait till they start dropping some. There's always a few that you find every year around the place, and I always like to keep them. In many cultures in southern Africa, bright blue feathers are often a sign of like a marriage proposal. I should collect a few, keep them handy. One day's one day's. <laughs> BK's laughing at me. BK, why, why is that funny? But it is a very nice morning. It is a very quiet. It's windy, but, but peaceful. We haven't actually seen a mammal come down to the dam yet. I'm not surprised, to be honest, because it is fairly cool and there's a bit of drizzle every now and again coming down. But we really wanted to film those goslings because the ones at Ndlovo Dam, unfortunately, seem to have not made it. The the Egyptian geese at Ndlovo Dam, we've seen them around for the last few days with not a single gosling in sight. Now they had six of them and normally you'd think that maybe half of them or at least some of them would survive but they seem to have lost the whole clutch quite early on. Maybe they'll have time enough to breed again this season, hopefully. But at least these ones, the ones here at Leopard Dam, there's still three of them. Gambling in the water as these red bull buffalo weavers gamble in the tree amongst the sticks and the branches. The nest is very well camouflaged. You can't see it very well. It's really hidden amongst the branches. I'm sure if we went to the other side of the dam, 
we'd see it a bit clearer. But it's actually really important because they, you know, their nest is full of chicks and eggs in the right time of year. I mean, right now, probably there's a few of them. It's an easy target for snakes and monkeys and things that could break that open. So by having it stuffed amongst the branches and very messy looking like this, makes it very difficult for at least the smaller predators to find their way in there. Actually not even sure if they might be the the brood host of some of the, the cuckoo species. Well, we're going to wait here a little bit longer just to see if that kingfisher flies somewhere where we can see it. Hopefully it's going to come out for us. So welcome back to the Mara. Our elephants are slowly grazing and uh, you can see the youngster just become calm right now. He was running up around, Excit exciting morning for him. But he looks like he's still busy. So much fun out here. Sometimes you see that those calves running after cattle egrets, running after every bird that is around their areas. Sometimes they, I've seen them even chasing jackals away, but the mothers are always watchful. Young males like that will be adventurous and you see them running up around. But the females will always be calm and they're always following the, the older females because they also don't leave these nettle herds. So they're always calm and watching or following, following the mother's instincts and behavior. Well, I'm still here with my jackals and they have gotten very, very comfortable with us here and I'm very pleased to see this because it means I'm guaranteed better chances of seeing them without them being very skittish. Yeah, it's a litter of four. I've seen them before. There is one that is tailless. And remember, these guys pair for life. They can vocalize and also they have amazing body language. In certain African tribes, they actually, you know, looked at as, you know, good luck charms. You know, some tribes, if you wake up very early in the morning and see one cross the road or, you know, wandering around the area while it's the first animal you see, it's going to be a wonderful day. Yeah, so they are referred to as good luck charms in other parts. Over here, they play their role as scavengers, but also foraging they do. Sitting like this, it means that they are waiting for the parents to come. I'm sure the adults won't be very happy to see them this relaxed with a vehicle close by. They normally give them body language that tells them, hey, you better get out there, and they will get out of here as quickly as possible. I can see they're starting to look in one direction. Maybe the parents are coming, you know, their way, but I don't know. Definitely they left them, you know, very early in the morning, and it's about time that they come back with a meal. Normally they might bring a small scrub here. Sometimes they'll come and regurgitate, you know, pieces of meat that they have swallowed. But 
yeah, these guys are still waiting. Very relaxed, almost sleeping. When it gets too hot, they will just get back into the shelter. They do have dens sometimes, and their dens have got multiple entrances, just in case of any threat, like a python going getting into the burrow. It is one of their main threats when they're small, snakes, and especially large ones like python. So when they see a python, they can exit. Also, in case of flooding, you know, they can also get away from a different entrance. So their burrows are interlinked and they can actually be as deep as almost nine feet inside. So they are very, very well protected from the sun during the day and at night from many nocturnal creatures. Yeah, he's still very wary of us, that guy. I did see one of the ones without the tail, but I cannot tell which one it is. Looks rather funny. They are very, very relaxed. I'm very happy about this. I don't know which one is the stumpy one. Yeah, total weight when they're actually fully grown, they weigh up to around almost eight kilos fully grown, so they're not very big. And you find them everywhere in our plains here. We have them in plenty, in big numbers. And actually the number is increasing. Yeah, very, very relaxed. I think the best thing for me to do is to leave them to relax like this so that they can give me another chance to come and see them maybe another day. Even when I start the vehicle, they're still relaxed. I'm happy about that. Okay, bye-bye, guys. Thank you. Well, let's take you to another live location. And here we are, as promised, at the nest. The white crested helmet shrike nest with lots of bizarre goings on. Now, what we're witnessing here and... I think it's absolutely incredible. So the other day we came and we saw what I believe to be the male and female adult helmet shrike oh, coming in to feed, which is normal. They obviously catch insects and they plonk them in the chick's mouth. What we witnessed yesterday was something I've personally never seen before. And it's the chin spot batis, both the male and the female feeding these chicks. Now, I managed to get fantastic photos, and it was definitely a little dewdrop spider that they were feeding. That's normally what they feed their chicks, spiders, in the first few days. And they were putting spiders directly into these chicks' mouths. Why? Why on earth would one species... Oh, the adults landed, the helmet, helmet shrike adults landed. Why would one species feed another species chicks? I can't believe it. That's a lot of energy, effort. Why would they do that? We were discussing it around the table last night and we thought possibly, I mean, there's three chicks in this nest and it's a very, very small nest. Confined space for sure. Does one of the chicks belong to the batis? Why is the batis feeding? I'm hoping we can catch it for you. A species is not going to do that for another species unless there's something else at play. That's a lot of effort, catching spiders and delivering them to these chicks here. It's utterly fascinating. I can't believe it. And the chin spot batis, the male and females, obviously look completely different. You can sort of really tell between the two. And... The females have chestnut on the chest with their chin spot being brown and the males do not. 
So it was definitely both the male and female that were feeding these chicks yesterday. And it just happened about five minutes ago. So I'm hoping if we're patient enough, we'll maybe witness it happening again. If any of you have any information on this or literature or stories where it's happened before, please do send them through to me because I've never witnessed this before when it comes to the helmet strikes and the chin spot battus. The chicks are obviously very, very altricial. And when any of the parents come back, it's just a case of opening your mouth as wide as you can and hoping that that insect is going to fall into your mouth and not your siblings. Now they are cooperative breeders. They have a really interesting family structure for birds, but that's within the same species. Why a different species would come and feed? For me, it's just baffling. But of course there has to be a reason. It can't just be for fun or kindness. It doesn't really work that way in the animal kingdom. So the parents are said to be monogamous for at least up to two and a half years, but they do live in sort of social cooperative breeding groups. I don't know this sounds strange, but just like wild dogs, And Paul, you're asking, do birds only build nests for laying eggs? Pretty much, yes. There's different types of nests, lots of different types of nests, from mere scrapings in the ground, like the spotted eagle owl, to the sort of very elaborate things that the grebes, the little grebes make in the water, floating nests, to holes in trees that have maybe previously been made by woodpeckers, but then other species come along and think, aha, uh -huh, this is the perfect place for a nest, to normal nests that you see like the Wahlberg's eagles that are maintained year after year. Then you get the weavers like the masked and the village weavers that create those sort of bubble, almost like a Christ Christmas bubble hanging in the trees. So this so many different types of nests, but yes, the main function for a nest is for laying eggs. Sometimes it's the male that does all the work, sometimes it's the female. Sometimes it's both. Or sometimes it's a massive sort of collective effort, like the sociable weavers and the buffalo weavers. And also, just another update, I believe somewhere in the east, I haven't quite determined where, Mulwati has been found with Shadulu. That explains a lot of the male and female tracks. I think they are mating once again. So we're going to sit here a little bit longer and hopefully see this batis come back and feed the chicks that don't belong to them. What we have here is something very interesting. We were driving along, we left Leopard Dam to see what else we could find, and we came across this pile of elephant dung. It's very old, the elephant dung is fairly dry, but with the wet, moist weather that we've had the last couple of days and the cooler temperatures, uh, we've found that mushrooms are springing up everywhere with incredible speed. These mushrooms have probably only been growing for two or three days since the sort of cloudier, cooler weather started, and you can see their fruiting bodies are almost completely grown. So they're going to open up a little bit more. And the spores are going to start dropping from underneath that bell shape at the top there, which will then create the next generation of mushrooms. These are, I mean, I'm not an expert on mushrooms. I certainly would never, ever try and ingest or eat any mushroom that I found in the bush unless I was with an absolute expert in these things. But I do know that quite a few of the fungi that we find in the, in the low felt, this area, are edible especially the ones that come out of a lot of termite mounds, um, the larger ones, generally quite edible. But don't ever try and eat any mushroom unless there's a registered expert that's with you that helps you to um, identify the mushrooms itself. I know what's quite interesting is that 
uh, elephant dung is very, very uh, like nutritious because they, they eat lots of random stuff and they don't digest it fully. So then when they defecate inside there, there can be lots of seeds and things which will then grow. So if you were to, let's say, pick up a piece of elephant dung, take it and put it in a pot and water it regularly, you're probably going to find lots of things growing out of it, which is amazing. I actually think I want to try that at some point to see just how many different species of plants might grow out of a single elephant dung. Um, but you, you see these kind of fungus quite a lot growing in the, um, in, in, in the low felt. And there are different types. There are little brown ones, there are these white ones. Um, I know, after doing a bit of research, that a lot of these uh, fungi tend to have uh, some what do they call it, psilocybin, something like that, which is the hallucinogenic properties. So also another reason not to just go willy-nilly chomping down on mushrooms because you're going to find yourself very confused, I'm, I'm sure. It's very interesting to watch. And one of the things I'd like to actually learn is to collect mushrooms and get myself a mushroom book or have an expert come with me and we walk around at this time of year now, perfect time for these mushrooms to be, to be fruiting and try and identify them love to know just how many of these are edible because I love eating mushrooms. Mushrooms are super tasty and a great source of protein as well. So I wonder, I've never really seen wild animals eating mushrooms before though. I wonder if any of the other guides have seen it before. I've never witnessed it. Maybe, maybe that's a question we can ask to the other, the other guides. Have you ever seen wild animals eating mushrooms? I suppose they all probably also know which ones are toxic and not. So if we see nothing eating them, it might be a good idea for us to not to not to go chomping down on them too. But very interesting nonetheless to see them. It was a couple of years ago that I found just around the one eco training camp in another reserve about ten or twelve different species. And it's amazing how you identify them. You can take the cap of a of a mushroom. First of all, you know, you let it grow fully, then you take the cap and you place it on a piece of paper, and out of it comes the spores. And those spores can be all sorts of different colors. You turn it upside down. There are gills, um, which, which can be different colors, different shapes. There's something called the skirt, which is the little part which is underneath. It's, it's really incredible how many different things you're looking for. It's just like trying to identify a, a, a plant, like a, like a tree. There are many different features you're looking for. And although this is what we see, the actual living body of this fungus is underground. And they sometimes form some of the largest organisms on the planet. That's just the fruiting body, remember. That's just like, for example, an, if you had an apple tree or a marula, the whole tree is underground in a mushroom sense. And this is just the fruits that we're seeing. So really, really interesting to have these around. I'm sure, we're expecting about two weeks of relatively warm, but cloudy and wet weather. And that is the perfect environment for these mushrooms to grow. So I fully expect to see some massive mushrooms erupting out of the sides of termite mounds and more elephant dung and other animals dung as well. Maybe that will be a project for me over the next few weeks to try and see if I can get someone to help me identify a bunch of mushrooms. If any of you can see this mushroom and are experts sitting at home looking at this and going, oh, I know exactly what that is, it'd be interesting to find out. Don't, don't forget to send your comments and questions uh, to us. If you have questions, we can answer them live right here now on the safari. You can send them to at FC, hashtag Wild Earth on Twitter, or you can send them if, if there are any kids watching, kids' questions would be, would be super great. If there are any kids that know what these mushrooms are, that'll be super impressive, and I'd be excited to hear about it. As you can see, there's a bit of blue sky, a bit of blue sky action happening. We've got some some open gaps coming out, so maybe we're in for a bit of warmer weather over the next few hours, which is actually really good for the plants, gets them to grow. A little bit of photosynthesis, beautiful. And then I'm sure later on we're going to expect a bit more rain, clouds, and wind. It's a gorgeous, gorgeous low felt morning.
So I'm still sitting with some very lazy Birmingham Pride Lions. And that one, I've been watching, it's been dreaming. So if you have a look at his paws, every now and then his paws are flicking as though in his dreams he's hunting something. He's so nice and relaxed. It seems to be a common trend with the way that they're lying. Look at him and his brother, the white one. <laughs> also lying with the same paw crossed over. And then even further left, another young male lying like that. So it seems to be an and beyond Angala line thing. <laughs> and they're enjoying a really nice snooze today. In fact, the young males have hardly moved at all only been the very young youngsters that have done a bit of a reposition they've come out of the grass and they're lying in amongst all of the older half brothers and sisters and there you can see that younger male well younger than the ross males <laughs> so he's actually done a full flip he's rolled over onto his back and then flopped over towards me But actually, the longer I've been watching them, the more I've noticed that they do have quite full bellies. Even the very little ones, the youngest cubs, have full bellies. Oh, look at the little tail moving. You can actually hear all the birds in the background here as well. Oh, and the flies bothering. It's a stunning morning here, actually. The temperature's perfect for these lions to stay right here on the road the whole day. They don't need to worry about shade. Their bellies are full, so they're going to be digesting. And they can just relax and reposition every now and then. Kerry, that's a very interesting question. Lions have been known to kill other lions. It's normal for lions to be territorial, especially maybe a new male taking over a pride. Um, they might kill the cubs of another male. Actually, just as I got back, the most, one of the most crazy sightings, we actually came across a big male lion eating a lioness and they'd killed all five of her cubs. So the rest of the pride was playing with the cub bodies. Um, one of them was actually still alive, but the other male was actually eating this lioness and there was almost nothing left of her, which is quite unusual. I've heard of it, but I'd never seen it before. And it had quite an impact on me. Um, you know, we, we're very objective out here um, you know, you see things for what they are, you know how nature works, but to actually see it was was quite an experience. Um, I had never ever seen something like that before and he was literally eating this entire lioness and she was big. She was a really big lioness. Um, so it, it does happen, but I can't say that we've seen it particularly often. I've been coming to the bush for 26 years, almost every single year I've come to the Kruger Park and I mean I've been living here for three and a half years. And I'd never seen anything like that before. I'd heard of it happening and I'd obviously seen dead lions from fights of other lions, but I'd never actually seen it happen where they actually eat other lions. I don't think that happens very often. Normally they'd leave a dead lion from a territorial fight for hyenas to, to eat. But I mean, it, it can happen when the two Ross males took over this pride. Um, they actually killed all of the cubs that were already in the pride. They didn't eat them, but they killed them. Um, but 
Not something that is particularly common to actually witness them eating each other. Fantastic question, Kerry. They, white lions are incredibly rare. Um, and the reason there aren't as many in the wild is a combination of a few things. The first one is obviously you can see how, how white he is. So he doesn't camouflage very well. And so that's actually considered a disadvantage in this kind of environment. So in terms of hunting, in terms of survival, not only will he not be able to hunt as efficiently as other lions because animals can see him coming, but also he's much more prone to getting eaten by other male lions or even hyenas when he's very young. So they've been very lucky, these two white lions, they've made it very far considering that they are white. Um, but it is definitely a disadvantage because you cannot camouflage. So you are in plain sight all the time. Um, the other reason is it's a gene that is not particularly common anymore. It's not a mutation, it's actually what's called a recessive gene. And I loved genetics at university when I studied zoology. Um, it's a recessive gene. So what happens is for him to have come out white, he needed a gene both from his mother and from his father, compared to that lion who's busy dreaming, that he might carry the white gene, but because he didn't get both white genes, being recessive, the dominant gene, which is that color that he is, that tawny color, takes over. So in order to come out white, you need to have both recessive genes for color, for one from mom, one from dad. There are gonna be a few members of this pride that have only one gene, maybe from the mom or from the dad, but not from both. And so the tawny color will take over. And so they look tawny to us, even if they have one gene for the white color, which is recessive. So recessive versus dominant genes basically just means that the recessive one will only show because it's weaker if both are there. Dominant means even if there's another color gene there, the dominant one will always come through externally. So because of that, it's not a particularly common gene. So we don't see a lot of white lines in the wild. And so it's something that has been, it used to happen a few years ago this area is where the first white lines originated. Whoa. Got a bit of a fright there from the little cub. Got a bit irritated. Um, but white lines were not seen in the wild for a very long time until very recently in the last five years. Shame, this one's looking a bit put out now because it got shouted at. Got a bit of discipline from the older half-sister. Big sigh. <laughs> Again, one pull crossed and one flat. Oh, big stretch. You can see how full that belly is. So I think what I'm going to do, I'm going to start heading back towards the river, see what else I can find and leave these sleepy cats to their nice cool morning on the road. Well, look at what I have in a distance. I have some giraffes and they are in a perfect habitat adapted to feeding trees as you know and so they in perfect spot at the moment our common tree our commonest little shrub or tree it is a tree and doesn't grow for to more than five meters it's the orange leafed croton and it is one of their favorite food this time of the year looks like they might come out into the open our giraffes here have been doing really really well the numbers have been going up although they are endangered i still always have to remind myself the numbers are going up this is due to safety has been increased over the last you know about 18 years 
they become safer up down here. <clears throat> it used to be poaching prone, but the poachers have been eradicated around these areas because the rangers are always patrolling and every now and then they'll make a big soup of certain areas like that forest. They'll come and decide to surround it and just go through it, removing snares and flushing out poachers and that has deterred you know the poachers quite a lot uh, looks like those guys are really enjoying that bush and there is enough for them they don't need to move we're still sitting here and it happened once the chin spot bat is the male, I think, the all black individual, came and fed one of the chicks a spider. Now, from what I can see, I spy with my little eye, all of these chicks are helmet shrikes. They all look exactly the same. They're getting far too large for this tiny little nest on this cumbritum, far too large. They're stretching their wings. Wing exercises are very important for young birds. But why on earth the chin spot batis is feeding them, I don't know. It's amazing, actually. They just sit here all day, not moving. Really, really camouflage against the bark of this tree until mum or dad or clearly the batis comes and feeds. Now, of course, Trishala mentioned there were five, which is slightly sad. But these three are getting bigger and bigger. Jen, I wouldn't say adoption. Of course, the cuckoos are the most famous for sneaking their eggs into other birds' nests, brood parasites. And what this means is you're not spending any sort of energy whatsoever in raising your chicks. You're actually smart enough to know that if you put it into a nest of another species, they will raise it for you. Now, there's lots of different types of brood parasites. And... Um, it's a great example of nature versus nurture because even although a cuckoo of any type is raised in a different bird's nest, you will find that it's still a cuckoo. It still behaves like a cuckoo, it still grows into a cuckoo and then goes on to display the exact same behaviour. And that's nature, right? They are not nurture, even although it was nurtured by a different species. So I'm not sure adoption would be the correct term, but brood parasitism is very, very common in certain species of birds. Does the batis want this nest afterwards? Is it a little bit confused? Oh, oh, here you go, here we go. Yes. pants pays off. That was such a winner. I hope you all saw that. Look at these chicks fighting. I do not know how they're all fitting in there. Oh, one little bird poop there. They poop over the side, hoping that it falls down. That was incredible. I have no idea what it fed with my naked eye, but I'm guessing a spider. I just can't believe this. And it just shows you just sitting and spending time in a small sighting like this is sometimes worth it. I mean, we've been sitting here for about 20 minutes now, but it paid off. You all got to see what I'm talking about. I 
absolutely remarkable. Now that was the meal. There was no sort of chestnut chest or breast or chin spot. That was the meal. Chin spot batters have that iconic call. Do, do, do. Do. That's probably not a very good example, but it sounds something like this. It sounds like they're almost singing three blind mice. Three blind mice. I'm so glad we got to share that with you all. And the, the adult helmet shrikes keep coming and going as well. They're not deterred by this. Leopard lover, you are asking when do the chicks leave the nest? I have no idea. I'm going to check for you right now. But they're very altruistic at this stage, so I would imagine they've got a little bit more growing and developing to go. All group members help in caring for the young. So we're possibly seeing a lot of different individual helmet shrikes coming to feed us, maybe not just mom and dad. And... Oh, they're fed mostly by siblings. I did not know that. In the family group, they're cooperative breeders. The chicks are fed mostly by the siblings. They usually leave the nest at 17 to 22 days. And it's actually before they can fly well, they leave the nest. And I can imagine that because this nest is not going to last for much longer at this rate they're growing. And they're said to be independent at around five months. There you go. I did not know that also. So 17 to 22 days. So around the three week mark, give or take, they leave the nest, leopard lover. And this is very close to the hyena den. We really haven't left this area for the whole morning. <laughs> We've spent three and a half hours in the one area. But I'm very glad I got to share that with you all. And we're going to take a short bumble to quarantine to see if we can find anything else for you all. Welcome back to the Mara. I've come to the Mara River to follow the zebra crossing, but it seems like they're all gathering, doing the waiting game, watching the river, but this time round, today they're not at the same spot that we saw them yesterday. They just walked further downstream, and it seems like they're all deciding on whether to go to the river or not. Some of them are grazing and some of them are thinking of getting closer to the river, but it seems like it's a bushy area and it's sometimes that point can be seen like a nice spot for them, but it's a little bit slopy. So it's, it's a point that has been used by lots of zebras and wildebeest to cross to the other side. The only disadvantage of that point is it's bushy, it's not as open as the, as the one that we saw yesterday. Looks like at the main crossing where we saw them yesterday, there's lots of crocs. But sure, sure enough is that these zebras are very brave when they decide to get across. I'm sure if they don't do it now, they may be doing it maybe in the afternoon. So we will be keen to also come in the afternoon to see them crossing. You can see some stallion playing, fighting there, biting each other. As some of them are deciding also to head back to their mainland. But I'm sure they want to cross because we've seen 
lots of this crossing happening at this time and late afternoon. So we've come to that part where we almost closing the show. Thank you so much for all who joined us. Thank you so much for your questions and comments. We really appreciate them. So we're looking forward for a nice afternoon where I think I'll also be coming here to check if there'll be a possible crossing. So I might, I might cross my fingers to see them cross again. Please visit our website wild, wild earth slash explorers to see what we've been doing now currently and it will be nice for you to drop your comments and questions as we look forward for another good evening good afternoon for the sunset safari <laughs>